it's like any injury. You can't make it. There's no. Uh, there's no magic answer to whether somebody needs neurological rest or not. It's based on symptoms. And like, if you, if you have a partial ACL tear, should I deload your knee or should I load your knee? What's the right thing to do? What would be the answer to that question? Do you have partial ACL tear, partial meniscal tear? Should I deload your knee or load your knee? And how do you decide? Does your knee hurt? Yeah, their knee hurts. Now, how do you decide whether to deload them or load them? I don't know, do both. Trial loading. What? I mean, what? Yeah. Just trial loading. Trial loading. Yeah. So you would, you would add a little bit, right? You test the water and you assess response. You provide what? An input. You have to understand the relationship between the input and the output to know what to do with the patient. So if you don't, actually do an intervention you could also by the way trial offload right right trial offload trial onload you got to do one or the other but you perform a trial you do a you run an experiment and you assess response so why would why if the brain is made of human tissue and this law applies to human tissue why would the brain be different we said we, we treat the brain like it's some neurological like mystery, like it was formed by God and the rest of us wasn't or something like that. I don't know. We treat the brain in this bizarre manner. Like it's some, like, it's like in the clouds. We don't understand it. It's tissue. It's just tissue. It's made of cells. It behaves really in a really cool way, but it's basically a bag of cells. Those cells have been traumatized. When you get a concussion, you get a stretch induced injury of the bait of the brainstem and and if you get a coup counter coup you also get injury to the frontal lobe and to the parietal lobe and so and the occipital lobe so it's tissue it's been injured and it needs to recover the way that injured tissue needs to recover then the inflammation in the brain may go away but that doesn't mean that the, that the neurons are all working normally just like when you look at an MRI, someone can have pain and real load tolerance problems, but the MRI looks fine. So um, with these patients, the notion that the research says do this, so you should do this, this is not good medicine. This is not good practice of medicine. It's patient-centered, not evidence-centered. So if you, if you load a patient neurologically, television, homework, and they, they're not really getting much better. Obviously, this is someone who does not need to be loaded as a solution. And by the way, rehab is load. So if you send somebody to vestibular therapy, ocular motor therapy, this therapy, all at the same time, plus they're in school, plus they're on screens, when you we're wondering why she's not getting any better. So the thing that's, that therapy does that school doesn't is we control the load. We control the dose. We control the exposure. And school doesn't. So because we control the dose and the exposure and school doesn't, and we monitor symptoms online, not offline, right? We look at our online symptoms. What are our symptoms right now as we do something? School is only looking at our offline symptoms. You had a day of school. How do you feel today? Well, it's like, it's too late. So, um, it's, it's important to understand that what we really want to do is control the experiment like we do with anybody. If I'm rehabbing your knee and you're going to CrossFit, Zumba, bar method, and you're seeing a chiropractor and an acupuncture and you're seeing me, how the hell do I know what's going on? This is the same, you understand that the frame, this is what I'm trying to like communicate here. The frameworks of treatment don't change no matter what sport you're treating or what body part you're treating. The principles are the principles are the principles. They don't change. So if somebody has too many cooks in the kitchen, and in her case, it's going to be television, homework, you know, online with friends, texting, those are all too many inputs. And you can't control the situation. You're not going to be able to figure anything out because you're going to do the same thing everybody else did. You're going to give her more inputs. And she's not going to process them well because her neurological system is in overload and what it really needs is deload.
And as so, far as as far as just as more background, as far as I asked the mom, was there ever a time except for the three to four days after the first concussion that she absolutely did nothing? And I told her my experience where I did nothing, like literally lied in bed and no screens, no anything for like a, for a, a long period of time, like a week or two. And she was like, no. I don't know how they, I don't know. <laughs> crazy. I bet you if you ask the other question, which is, has there ever been a time ever since her first concussion where she didn't have any headaches? The answer would probably also be no. No. So, okay, so, okay, clear that we do a uh, blood pressure, so a, a vascular exam. Uh, then we do uh, a, a non movement based neurological exam. So, non movement based neurological. If she passes that, you move into a static physiological exam. So that's gonna be standing, feet together, eyes open, standing, feet together, eyes closed. And if need be, standing, feet together on an AREX, standing, feet together, eyes closed on an AREX to look for balance, immediate balance deficits. You probably won't need to do an AREX. She, she's gonna have balance, she's been having balance issues. She already, okay. mom already told me that. Thank you. Yes. If you have loss of balance or marked sway without the ARX, obviously you don't need to sensitize the test. Right. Then, only then, when she passes all of that stuff without an increase in her symptoms, then you start moving her body and her head. Okay. But don't do that first because you might make her dizzy and the exam's over within the first couple of minutes. Headache and dizziness hit. Exam's done, it's not gonna tell you anything. And now she's symptomatic and anything more. So you really have to, like it's kind of like, again, the principles are the principles of the principles. If you're examining a partial ACL tear, the first thing you do is not grab the knee and perform a rapid Lockman's test. Right. It's like you just went right after the injured tissue, <laughs> you know? Assess the hip, assess the foot and ankle, watch right. them walk. Don't grab the knee and start yanking on the ACL, right? So right. same thing. Yeah. You have cervical pain with headaches and concussion. You don't start having them whip their head around moment one. Yeah. So the next piece of the static physiological exam is palpation. Because okay. I would suspect she has an upper cervical dysfunction. And by that, I don't necessarily mean subluxation the way it would be thought of in the chiropractic sense. But in, in a sense, the, her upper neck is not screwed on right. <laughs> she's probably driven by muscle spasm and pain, especially if she's walking around like this. Mom right. said that at the first, con first hit, the first concussion, her head snapped in a way, and she is, she is kind of off. So it all vibes with what you're saying. Right, so the crookedness of the head can either be caused by altered sensory perception in the brain, much in the same way a patient who's had a stroke becomes, when they become hemiparetic, their shoulder drops, their head tilts, their hip, their, right? Same thing, when you concuss the brain enough, the sensory perception can be distorted, in which case she thinks this is normal, or she has a vestibular issue because when you get hit in the head, you can screw your vestibular system up as well, or she's got a neck problem. So if you do the vestibular stuff first and you do the ocular motor stuff first, and that all seems kind of okay, and her eyes converge properly, which is a big sign, they lose convergence with concussions. Then you start going, now let's direct our exam towards the cervical spine. Right. And the first place you go to is gentle one finger palpation, looking for reproduction of headaches. So it's going to be occiput, so suboccipitals, splenius, semispinalis. You pinch the sternocleidomastoid. You pinch the upper trapezius. And depending upon where the headaches are, if she has frontal headaches, you also come and you put your finger on the corrugator and procerus here, and the muscles of mastication, the temporalis and the masseter. And you gently, with one finger, 
try to see if palpation to these areas specifically reproduce her symptoms, particularly her head pain. Okay. But you do it really gently because if you do it too hard, again, you're going to incite maybe a headache. Okay. Then after you do that, I would almost recommend considering the possibility of doing a passive exam before an active exam. Maybe. Maybe. Mm -hmm. It depends upon how irritable people are. And if they start to become symptomatic, I'm like, okay, just lie down. Let's just re relax for a little bit. And then I'll kind of come in and just do a really gentle upper cervical exam with them. And just some okay. really gentle passive because it's actually more aggressive. It's less aggressive when you take gravity off the cervical spine. So the right. passive exam is less aggressive, although the active exam, they have more perceived control. Right. But right, so when right, you have right. soft hands, you can make a passive cervical exam feel very relaxing. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's say you're okay to do a active range of motion exam. Then you do, you know, your cervical flexion. What do you feel? Come back, mm -hmm. let her reset, ask her if she's dizzy or has any headaches after a repetition. Okay. And then rotation next and extension last because it's usually the most provocatory. Right. Okay. Now let's say she does her cervical exam and things look wonky. So oftentimes with these patients, you'll see, you'll see this aberrant dysfunctional motor pattern and it'll look like this. You see there's a teenager who had a concussion. Notice how she tilts her head back, we get this right cervical deviation and a lot of left to right wobble. It almost kind of reminds you of those bobble heads on the front of taxi cabs. As she tilts her head back, notice the right cervical deviation. This is in slow motion now. Watch as she brings her head back. There's a left motion, right motion, and then another left motion, right motion. It's very hard, very hard for her to stay on plane uh, when she brings her head into flexion and extension. We see this again with an adult. Um, as she rotates her head to the right, watch it in slow motion at the end of the range of motion. Look at all those little micro corrections to get the eyes level with the horizon. Um, that's evidence of what we see here. This bobblehead situation is uh, evidence when upper cervical muscles are not functioning, kind of like when you get core inhibition with back pain. Right. So it's a, uh, I can't remember what the name of the strategy is called. It's a hypofacilitation strategy. It's like in back pain, right? Someone gets back pain, some people get really rigid and stiff. And right. Move on block. That's hyper facilitated. And some yeah. people, everything shuts off and they get real loosey and everything's like unstable. That's hypo facilitated. Okay. Principles of principles of principle. The spine's the spine. The cervical spine's gonna do the same thing. Either people lock their neck down and start turning like this, mm -hmm. or all their stabilizer muscles go to sleep because they, they are aggravating or entrapping free nerve endings and cause pain, and the neck just becomes really wobbly. Sure. And so you start to see that. So look for that in the active range of motion exam. Okay. Okay. Uh, then you, if you, if she's got positional dizziness, if she mm -hmm. has positional dizziness, you do an upper cervical stability test. Positional dizziness, as in, as in, when she brings her head down, she starts to feel dizzy. Okay. Or her head back. You do an okay. upper cervical stability test. Lord knows I don't remember the names. This one where you wrap your arm around and you put your fingers on C1 and you, tra you, you have them flex and then you translate. Right, yeah. Remember that? Uh, I like sharp purser. Sharp purser, thank sharp you. Sharp purser, yeah. That would have never occurred to me. <laughs> you do a sharp purser exam. You can do mm -hmm. a tectorial membrane exam. Okay. Cervical distraction. Mm -hmm. right? The other ones I don't think are that sensitive. I think those are the two best. Okay. If she passes that, then you lay her down and you do an upper cervical mobility exam. So do you remember how we did this? We did this in training where you, where you take your hands like this and you flip them this way and then you do cranial flexion and extension. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cranial side bending. Yep. And you do it really slowly and you assess overpressure a little bit and you mm -hmm. try to get a sense if there's a huge asymmetry Right. Or reproduces her symptoms or pain. Okay. Okay. And then lastly, if she gets through the whole thing and she's still okay, mm -hmm. then you check 
her cervical muscle strength and her periscapular muscle strength. Okay. Just save that way for the end. So that's what, that's what, that's what my exam would look like for this person. Kathy, would you add anything or do anything differently? Any recommendations based on that? No, that sounds, <laughs> sounds good to me. Okay. What happens if we get really flared up somewhere in the beginning after the oculomotor exam? Well, first of all, the exam is basically over. Yeah. And then you, and then you explain to them what just happened. Okay. And you say, okay, clearly based upon the fact that my simple ocular motor exam just produced symptoms, I can right. certainly understand why your ocular motor rehab is not working because you're trying to load a tissue that needs to be deloaded. Right. She needs blue blockers, sunglasses, and neurological rest, not, you know, times one viewing. Right. And then you have a conversation and you explain the, the cranial nerve complex problem.